And welcome back from the spring break. Welcome back to databases. So the last couple of lectures, we were talking about different ways to optimize queries. And that's pretty much one of the major things that uh, databases will do for you. Uh, you have lots of different ways of implementing uh, a query. And a database will basically try and find the right one, uh, the one that will work best uh, without you having to think too deeply about, uh, about the query itself. Um, now, so far what we've covered is uh, a handful of optimization rules that are generally good. Um, so we talked uh, during the discussion of project two, uh, we talked about selection pushdown. Selection pushdown is almost always a good thing to do. If you can uh, cause a uh, selection predicate to filter out uh, to filter out tuples as early as possible, that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Um, today, what we'll, uh, we're going to talk about is cases where the distinction isn't quite so clear, where you might have two different possible ways to evaluate a query, uh, and you want to try and figure out which one of those you need to use uh, more than the other. Uh, which one of those is better than the other? So, to recap, some equivalences are always good. One of these is uh, selection pushdown. What are some others? What else can you do to a query to make it run faster? Sure, change cross products into joints. Is that yours? Push down projections. Another thing that's always useful. So there's some equivalence rules that are always good. What's an example of, can any, anyone uh, think of an example uh, of a rule that might be good? So here's one. Uh, what if I have a R join S join T? What are my options with this query? One option. And the other one? So I do a join of S and T, and then I join R with that. This is going to be the main thing that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this, uh, because this is pretty much one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, opportunities you have to rearrange, uh, to rearrange the. Um, to change the cost of uh, your query. So when I say cost, um, what types of, what do I care about in, in terms of uh, the efficiency of the query? What, uh, yeah? Okay, so uh, a query is going to take some amount of CPU time, it's going to take uh, some amount of memory, and it's going to require, uh, I'm going to twist, uh, change what you said slightly there. Um, uh, in, so storage, usually for all intents and purposes, assume we have infinite hard drive space. But uh, the challenge is trying to figure out how much we're going to, uh, how much information needs to go out to disk and how much information needs to come back to disk. Because that, that usually ends up being a uh, uh, throughput blocker. So. We have a couple of different uh, cost metrics. What can, we, what can we actually do to uh, figure out how much the query is going to cost? Okay, so uh, we can estimate the working set. 
Um, and another option is to, oh, um, we can uh, compare a bunch of different plans uh, by kind of doing some back of the napkin calculations. Before we actually run the query, uh, we can do some back of the napkin calculations to figure out how big uh, a data set uh, size we're going to be working with and use that information to try and guesstimate how much uh, I.O., how much memory, and how much CPU uh, the thing is going to cost. Another way, uh, and this is something that uh, databases use as well, is actually running the query itself. Uh, whether running a subset of the data, uh, a small chunk of the data, uh, to get an estimate of, of how, much, um, how much the thing is going to cost, or whether it's going to, uh, uh, to, to get an estimate of, of how much the, the plan is going to cost, or uh, simply keeping track of how much uh, a query cost you when you ran it. Um, and turns out you might need to run the same query over and over again when that happens. Uh, having statistics from previous runs is also helpful. Um, of course, uh, cost estimation uh, is a little bit of a, a black art. Um, you. Even the best uh, sometimes uh, get it wrong. Uh, and, you know, it turns out for our purposes, that's actually okay. Um, if we're going to, what we're, we're trying to do is come up with a solution that works okay in most cases. Um, we're trying to come up with a way of estimating the cost uh, of, of a query that'll make the right decision on which uh, strategy to take, which uh, order we evaluate the joins in, for example. If we get it a little bit wrong, we're still probably going to pick the same join order. If we get it a lot wrong, well, okay, maybe the query takes uh, a bit longer and someone actually has to, to go in there and tune it. But that's, that's okay. Um, our, our goal isn't to try and fix Everything. Our goal is to try and make it easy, uh, make the user's life easier in 90, 99 percent of the cases. Um, okay. So, getting back to it, we had uh, three costs that we were looking at: uh, the amount of memory that you need to store, uh, the amount, uh, the amount of memory that the query plan needs, uh, the amount of compute time that you need to actually evaluate. The, uh, the query, and the amount of I.O. that you end up performing. Um, now, in each of these cases, there's a number of constant factors that we can get from the schema, uh, the number of attributes uh, in, in a, a table, for example, will determine the working set size. Um, the number of attributes in a projection will de uh, determine the uh, compute cost of that projection. Um, but the one thing that is common uh, to all of these costs, the amount of memory, the amount of compute, and the amount of I.O., uh, is going to be the uh, size of a relation. How many rows are there in a particular uh, relation somewhere in, in the query? And so almost all of cost-based optimization in databases comes boils down in one way to uh, one way or another to estimating this value. If I join R and S, how many tuples are going to be in the result of that join? If I join S and T, how many tuples are going to be in the result of that join? Turns out this is surprisingly hard. So how do you do this? How do you, uh, how can you go about uh, estimating uh, the arity of a join without actually computing it in the first place. There's a couple of different uh, tactics we can take. Uh, so um, the simplest thing is that we make a guess. So if we have an equijoin, for example, um, maybe we guess that every tuple joins with one other tuple on the other side. Um, maybe we guess that the selectivity, uh, the, excuse me, uh, maybe we guess that the join is going to filter out maybe 90% of the tuples in the cross product. Turns out that actually gets you quite a bit of the way. If you can make a guess that uh, R join S 
filters out 90% of the tuples that, uh, that are in R cross S. Often is enough. Um, but of course, that's one strategy. Um, we can do a bit better, and most databases have uh, will actually go out and gather statistics about the tables. Um, they'll actually look at R and get some properties of R uh, and the data that's sitting in R. They'll take a look at S, see what kind of properties uh, are appear in the the data. Uh, sitting in S, so properties like the upper and lower bounds, um, the distribution of values in the data, um, and sometimes they'll even take samples or identify the most common uh, common um, values in each of these attributes. So, um, what we're going to focus on mostly today is using these summary statistics in order to get an estimate of how, uh, how many tuples there are in a particular, uh, in the result of a, a, a subquery. And the one thing I want to just emphasize and emphasize and emphasize over again is that there's no good solution. Um, each of the estimates that we're going to be talking about today is an approximation. Um, we can get arbit arbitrarily close uh, to a good estimate, but the, the more we work to get a good estimate of, um, of the query, uh, excuse me, the more we work to get a good uh, estimate of um, how large the relations are, the less, uh, the, the more time we're spending optimizing the query. And in general, if it takes us a day to optimize the query and the query itself takes five seconds to run, we haven't really saved ourselves anything. So while there isn't a perfect solution, uh, we don't need a perfect solution. We just want to find something that works most of the time. And if it turns out we're in one of these weird corner cases, then uh, we need to provide the user a way to, to override what we're doing. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, questions so far? All right, so let's look at uh, the types of statistics we might be interested in. So for each attribute, uh, we might want information about the domain of that attribute, um, the upper and lower bounds, for example. And if we have upper and lower bounds, we can use that information uh, to make a guess about the data, uh, about all of the data in that attribute. Um, a simple approximation that we can often use is to assume a uni uniform distribution of values. So if we have an upper and lower bound, uh, if we know that there are, uh, that a particular attribute has values from uh, 1 to uh, 20, and we have, uh, let's say, 80 attributes, then we can make a, we can hazard a guess that there is four copies of uh, value one, four copies of value two, four copies of value three, uh, four copies of value four, and so forth. So this is a uniform distribution uh, that, uh, between the lower and upper bound of values in, uh, in the, uh, that particular attribute. Uh, if we want to get a little bit more fancy, we can actually store uh, what are called histograms. Um, so we can store statistics that are a little bit more fine-grained, that give us a little bit more information about how the data is distributed uh, within uh, the, the range of values for that attribute. And if we want to get even more fancy, we can actually generate a set of samples uh, from the data. OK, so uniform distribution, histogram, samples. How do we actually use this information uh, to estimate the size of uh, a relation? So let's look at this from the perspective of uh, the selection operator. Because when it comes down to it, the one thing that actually removes tuples from a uh, relation is a selection operator. Cross product creates, uh, creates larger relations. The 
uh, projection, but it creates larger relations as n squared. It takes the, all of the tuples in one hand, uh, all of the tuples in the other, and it crosses them together. So you get uh, uh, n squared tuples in the output. Projection doesn't take, change the number of tuples, it just changes the schema. Uh, union, simple addition. So the one thing that's hard uh, in terms of estimating uh, selectivity is selection, because the, the filtering rate is data dependent. So let's look at uh, a really simple uh, selection predicate, um, A equals 1. So we're basically looking for rows where A is equal to 1. Anyone want to hazard a guess on how we can estimate the selectivity of, of uh, this, or how, how many tuples we get in the output? <clears throat> Let's say I tell you that uh, I have 1,000 tuples, and all of my values are between uh, 1 and 20 inclusive. Yeah. Let's say again. All the values for A. Yeah. So I know uh, I know that I don't have any values lower than one, and I don't have any values bigger than twenty. So roughly five percent. Where'd you get that? Okay, so if I know an upper and a lower bound, I can assume a uniform distribution over the data, and then I have 20 distinct values. Uh, it's an integer. Then the chance that this selection predicate will uh, hit one specific result is just the one over the number of distinct values of A, in this case, uh, one out of 20 or 5%. All right, let's look at a slightly more uh, complex example. Let's say I am trying to find values of A that are in some list. One, two, three, four, five. Let's say I have five values. Are you saying that you have a list of five values in a larger list? Oh, sorry. So I have... Um, I still have this constraint that A is uh, A only takes values between 1 and 20. But now what I want to find is my selection predicate is give me all of the A's that are 1, uh, or A is 2, or A is 3, or A is 4, or A is 5. OK, so it's the chance that I'll let a couple through is exactly that. The um, number of tuples, uh, sorry, the number of distinct values that I'm looking for over the number of distinct values uh, that fall into A. So, so far we've looked at uh, integer values. Um, equality only really makes sense if you're looking specifically at integers. Um, we can also have floating point numbers. Uh, so let's say that I'm looking that the domain of A is now a floating point number. Uh, between uh, 0 and 20. Um, and uh, I'm looking specifically for values of A that are less than 3. Um, so with uh, comparisons, you don't need precision. So uh, it's just strictly less than 3, so values in the range from 0 to 3 inclusive. Floating point numbers, inclusive and exclusive, doesn't matter. Congratulations, you've just... 
Uh, yep. So um, that's backwards. So the chance that um, I'll hit a value of a that is less than 3 is just 3 minus the lower bound divided by the total range. So this works pretty much the same way that, um, uh, that it does in the integer case. I need the fraction of the space uh, that falls into the, that it satisfies the predicate um, divided by the fraction of the space that doesn't satisfy the predicate. Or, Excuse me, the total size of the space. All right, so some warm up questions. Now for the interesting one. If I'm trying to find a join, I've got, uh, I can tell you off the, the top that uh, r dot a has values between 1 and 20, and s dot b has values between 1 and 20. So this one's a little bit more tricky. Yeah? Did you have to do a product like R and S like Malcolm? And Malcolm, I divide by, if they have, they pick the, which one the size has, A or B has bigger one, divided by. Um, so something involving multiples. Could you be a little clearer? Uh, if R is S, or S is S, So you're you're basically breaking the uh, breaking this down into uh, sort of two stages, if you will. Uh, if I can slightly alter uh, the answer there. Um, so why don't we take a look at this in a slightly different way? So we have a join of a join of two relations on A equals B. Now, part of the difficulty of estimating the uh, selectivity here is that now you're working with two variables. And those two variables, we're introducing a, a little bit of a correlation here. So let's break it down. Let's uh, split this up into two separate, uh, two separate steps. So let's say our relation R just contains a single row. The value here can take any value between 1 and 20. At least for the time being, it doesn't actually uh, matter which one we pick. So let's start with, let's take a, a one example. Let's look at uh, a row where A is 1. Now for this specific uh, example, this is equivalent to a much simpler query. In fact, this is pretty much identical to select from S where B equals 1. So I've essentially plugged that selection predicate in here. Plug the, the join predicate. So I have another row, two, essentially the same thing. Plug the two in here, and I'm just going to combine the results.
So for this predicate, or just, excuse me, for this query, what's my cell, or what, uh, how many, uh, what percentage of my input am I gonna allow through? One, yeah, one over 20, so 5%. Okay, so for every row of R, we're basically going to run, uh, excuse me, can't talk today. Uh, for every row of R, we're basically going to run this exact query once. So for 100% of R, we're going to filter out 5% of the matching values in S. 100% times 5%, 5%. So overall, the selectivity here is just going to be uh, the number of distinct, uh, so for any specific value of, uh, for any specific value of, uh, of B, we're going to filter out uh, excuse me, for any distinct value of A, we're going to filter out 5% of the Bs. You can look at that in reverse as well. So the chance of hit for any given B is going to be the number of distinct values of A. So the overall selectivity is, is going to be, uh, excuse me, the overall, uh, the, the number of tuples that you get in the output is going to be 1 over the number of distinct values uh, of um, either relation. Now, this changes a little bit if we have uh, key constraints. So let's uh, recall from just before spring break, we were talking about key constraints. Uh, so let's say that we know that A is a foreign key pointing to B. How many tuples, uh, what, what would our selectivity be then? How many tuples would we would we let through? So for every tuple in R, we match it up with exactly one tuple in S. And if B was a foreign key pointing to A, for every tuple in S, we'd let through exactly one tuple uh, from A. So we can look at this again in terms of chances of hit. Uh, per uh, per row of one relation. So for every row of S, we have some chance of hitting a row of A. For every uh, for every uh, for every row in uh, R, we have some chance of hitting a row in S. Okay, so uh, any questions up to this point? Yeah. Foreign key. All right, so there's, um, there's only so far that you can go looking uh, purely at uniform distributions. So let's take a look at a slightly more, uh, more fine-grained uh, statistic that we could gather, a uh, histogram. So uniform distributions are a very, uh, very strong assumption. Uh, and I'll give you a, a nice example of that. Let's say I have a, a table of people. And uh, I've got some people, ages, and uh, some sort of officer rank as well. Uh, and what I would like to do is uh, run a query where I find all of the people with some rank um, and uh, a specific age. Now, if I use a uniform uh, distribution, 
uh, my reduction factor, the, the uh, number of tuples that I let through, uh, is going to be 1 over the average number of distinct, uh, the, excuse me, the upper and lower bounds. So um, I have values between 19 and 22 here. Uh, so the reduction factor on age, I'd end up letting through uh, exact, excuse me, uh, exactly one out of every four uh, tuples in my input. Um, now conversely, on rank, I have values between uh, one and three. So uh, excuse me, uh, values between. Three out of eight. Eight distinct values. Three. Yeah, well, uh, rank equals three, but that's uh, that should be one over three. Let's fix that. All right, sorry about that. Um, so um, there are three distinct values of rank. So my reduction factor, the, the number of tuples that I'm expecting to uh, let through, uh, is going to end up being 1 over 3. Ah, that's what it is. Um, 1 out of 3. So 1 out of every 3 tuples passes through by rank. One out of, out of every four tuples passes through if I filter first on age. So, well, simple, uh, simple math. I'd like to take the one that filters out uh, the most uh, first. Um, so in this particular case, I'd prefer to filter out on age before I filter out on rank. Questions? Yeah. Uh, say again? One third is, uh, so this is the number of uh, tuples I let through. So I, I keep one fourth if I filter on age, I keep one third if I filter on, uh, on rank. Assuming a uniform distribution. Questions? Yeah. Uh, we want less to filter through. The less data, the more data we can get rid of, the sooner, the better. So, uh, think of this as, as uh, an assembly line. Um, you've got two people in, in, an, in an assembly line. One person, uh, and um, one of them uh, throws away three-fourths of what they get, and uh, another person throws away two-thirds of what they get. Um, you want to put the, uh, in order to make, uh, the, the, the first person is going to do, uh, assuming that they do the same amount of work for every uh, tuple that they look at, um, you can Assuming that these two processing steps uh, do the same amount of, uh, of work per tuple that they look at, I can make, I can't do anything to reduce the amount of work that the first of these is doing. I mean that, uh, but I can pick which one I do first, which means that I can pick, uh, I can control how much effort this, uh, this step is putting in. 
Uh, and ideally, I'd like to minimize the amount of work that the second step is doing. Question? Yes. Yep. Making, uh, assuming that you have a uniform distribution. So this, that's what you reduce the this data size to. Well, the so the the total amount of, of uh, let's start throwing some labels here. So, assuming that age and and, uh, and rank are not correlated, then I, if I have uh, let's say x tuples going in, you can have x tuples going in to both. Uh, the first step of this plan and the first step of this plan. Here, if I filter first on age, I'm going to have one fourth of x tuples in here. Here, I'm going to have one third of x. Now, here, I'm going to have one twelfth of x and one uh, twelfth of x. So, what I have here what I have here is the same. But what I have here is different. And so what I'd like to do is come up with a plan that minimizes the one thing that I have the ability to control. Now, there's one thing I'm kind of surprised no one's called me on here. What could I do bet even better? Yeah? Filter on name. Uh, so I don't actually have a predicate for name. Uh, uh, what do you mean by Kerpai? Ideally, I'd like to reduce the number of, of tuples overall. There, but the, the query doesn't have a group by. So the, the query is. Essentially, just do a projection uh, and then two uh, two selection predicates. You change that to a natural join. Uh, there's no join in the query. It's just from. Why am I doing this in two steps? Why not just do rank and age? Um, so to preempt the question I just asked myself. Why don't you do both? Um, so we've we've talked about uh, indexes, and what is an index? At least from the perspective of a relational algebra plan. So what does an index allow us to do? Look up your data fast. Could you be more precise? Okay, so there's some sort of organization on the data that allows me to, to like, what, what am I looking up? Or uh, how am I looking it up? Okay, so I have some specific conditions that uh, I'd like, uh, that I'd like to, uh, the, the data that I'm, I'm interested in to satisfy. Um, like, for example, the data falls within a specific range of values, or the data is equal to some specific value, and um, and if I have an index, I can find some predicates. Uh, I can answer uh, some selection predicates uh, over that index much faster than if I. Uh, much faster than scanning over all of the records. So in other words, selection predicate sitting on top of relation is something that can be handled by an index much more efficiently than running a selection predicate explicitly 
over all of the data in the relation. So to answer the, the question, why don't you evaluate these together? Let's say we have an index on age and an index on rank. We can pick which index to use depending on, uh, depending on this reduction factor. And in this particular case, uh, we would expect that the index on age would help us out a lot more than the index on uh, rank. Yeah? So if you had an index on age and rank together, yes, you could uh, answer both together. If you had an index on age or rank, the, the drawback to having an index on both age and rank together is that if you only have an age or you only have a rank, um, depending on how the index is structured, you may not be able to retrieve uh, all of the records that have a specific age without, without a, a, a filtering constraint on, on rank as well. Um, so there's, there's no guidelines in general for when to and when not to use indexes, but there are pros and cons. So the pro is it makes your queries faster. Um, if, I have, uh, if I have an index on age, it's going to make this query a lot faster. If I have an index on age and rank, it's going to make this query even faster. Um, so ideally, if all you're doing is asking questions, uh, running queries, you want as many indexes as possible. You want every single index that you could possibly imagine. Of course, you're paying something to get an index. So what are you paying? Thoughts? Space. So that's really the big thing. Every time you create an index, you're basically adding more than, you're more than doubling the amount of, of storage that you're using. Because you've got to store the data, as well as the index if it's a clustered index. And if it's an unclustered index, then it doesn't improve your results quite as much, your, your performance quite as much. Um, what about, uh, what else are you paying? So this is a little more uh, a subtle point uh, because we haven't actually cut, uh, covered this yet, but every time you have an index, you actually have to maintain that index if the data changes. So if I add another, uh, another person to this list, uh, H -I, um, uh, uh, Ivanova, um, then you're going, to, uh, you're going to have to update every single index that, uh, that is built over that table. So essentially you're, you're, you're making it easier to answer questions about the data, but harder to make changes to the data. So usually, just in terms of general guidelines, uh, you have indexes on one, sometimes two attributes. Usually if you have more attributes, it, uh, it depends on what kind of query workloads you have. But just in, in general, it's usually good to have an index on every attribute that, uh, that you filter on regularly. Um, Often this means primary keys like IDs that you'll use to, to look up table, uh, look up values in a table. Um, and anytime you have uh, common attributes that uh, get filtered over, you also want an index over those as well. Um, does that address your question? Yeah. Are indexes only stored in RAMs like on disk? Uh, so our index is stored only on disk or in RAM. Um, so in a typical database, an index is going to be stored uh, on disk and then uh, cached in RAM, or parts of it are going to be cached in RAM. Um, there are certainly uh, there are certainly databases that operate entirely in memory, and there are certainly databases that uh, pull things uh, that that 
kind of builds indexes on demand. So a brace hash join is, is an example of kind of an index built in memory for one specific use case. Um, not sure if that, uh, does that address your question? But yeah, the, the common case is the index goes on disk and gets uh, brought into RAM. Okay, uh, let's do one more quick bit of motivation and then take a quick break. Um, so, okay, I've got, uh, I've got two different indexes here and at least based on what I've figured out so far, it makes more sense for me to use the index on age or use the, the, the plan where I filter on age first. Is that the right thing to do? So what, what's my favorite answer to it, Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, so it depends. And what does it depend on? So let's say I ask for uh, age is, uh, let's take a look at each of these uh, one at a time. I've got two queries. Let's say I ask for uh, the people with rank of three and age of 20. Right, so if I filter out on ages 20, half of the people have an age of 20. So I'm going to reduce, in, in practice, what's going to happen is that I'm going to reduce the size of my data only by a half. And if I had filtered on rank first, I would have filtered out a third of my data, making my life a whole lot simpler when it came time to, to filter on age. On the other hand, uh, let's say I'm asking specifically for people whose age is 19, then I end up uh, filtering out uh, almost the entire table, and I only keep uh, one, one tuple in the output. So uh, in that particular case, age is best. Now, this example is, is tiny, and, and uh, maybe you don't really... Uh, uh, just to, to emphasize the point, if you're dealing with uh, a terabyte of data, even filter, even the difference between uh, filtering by a quarter and filtering by a fourth uh, could mean hours of uh, compute time or do, uh, hundreds of dollars of Amazon. Yeah? So in practice, do you keep count of each value's repetition? Well, that's exactly... So... That's exactly what we'll get into. Uh, let's take a five-minute break, uh, and then, uh, that, yes. All right. So, um, it sometimes, uh, so doing a uniform assumption works reasonably well, but we could potentially do better. Um, and one way that we could do better is by keeping more detailed statistics uh, about the data. Now, if we want it to be really, 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 really precise, what we could do is count the number of occurrences of every single distinct value uh, in, in the table. Uh, so essentially count, uh, count star group by uh, the, the particular attribute. Uh, so in the example that we had uh, before, there was 119, there were two 20s, there were uh, four 21s, and there was one 22. The problem with this is that there could be a very large number of distinct values. Uh, and so keeping around a full histogram for every single uh, distinct value that could occur uh, in the relation is just impractical. Uh, what's worse is that if you're uh, dealing with floating point numbers, there are no distinct values. So instead, uh, the idea of a histogram is that you start bucketing values together. So for example, I could say uh, that I'm interested in the values between 19 and 21, and then the values, uh, excuse me, 19 and 20, and then the values between 21 and 22. So on average, the values between 19 and 20 I have one and a half, uh, one and a half uh, unique, uh, sorry, one and a half values for every distinct uh, element between 19 and 21. I have two and a half uh, values for every distinct, two and a half 
rows for every distinct value between 21 and 22. So I can essentially combine multiple buckets together to get a better estimate of uh, the number of distinct values between 19 and 21, essentially summarizing uh, my statistics, uh, making it so that I have fewer statistics to deal with, but still kind of giving me a more fine-grained picture of what's going on. Yeah? Uh, for the Okay, so another um, another thing that I uh, that you could do it. So just like raw data on it, but like I see. Like that's assume that you're hashing. So, so you could. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, there there's a huge. Um, uh, oh, let me back up. So the the question was, uh, couldn't you use like a hash function to generate a, a summary that didn't create these these uh, correlations. Is that a fair way of saying it? That didn't kind of correlate uh, values that are close together. Um, and yes, uh, so there's a huge um, field of statistics uh, the, and uh, math uh, in general uh, called, uh, that deals with what are called wavelets. Um, and wavelets are kind of a generalized form of histograms that uh, summarize, or sketches, wavelets and sketches that uh, summarize different statistical properties of a data set uh, and those, making sure that those summaries satisfy certain types of uh, correctness guarantee, or cer certain types of um, statistical properties themselves. Uh, so if you wanted to avoid um, correlations between adjacent attributes, one way to do that would be to use a hash table instead of uh, just kind of grouping things together uh, based on adjacency. Um, but that's, there's, a, there's a whole rabbit hole that, uh, that you've just opened up there. Um, I would be happy to, to discuss it offline. Um, okay. Uh, any further questions? Okay. Now, taken to an extreme, uh, what will happen here is if I just create one single bucket, I end up with an average number of elements uh, for the entire, uh, entire table. And basically, at this point, I'm just back to lower and upper bounds. OK, so how do we actually use this uh, information? So let's say that I have um, 170 records in total. Uh, and what I've uh, generated in my histogram is a list of the number of distinct, uh, the number of distinct records uh, between, excuse me, I have 1,700 records, uh, and I've generated the number of, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, I've, I've generated a histogram that tells me um, how, many <clears throat> how many records I have uh, in, in each bucket on average. So if I was looking for uh, records where A was 33, um, how would I go about doing that? Okay, so I take a look at the bucket for everything between 30 and 40, and I find that on average there are 30 records uh, for every distinct value between 30 and 40. Okay, 33 falls between 30 and 40, so great, I figured it out. I've got 30, uh, 30 distinct records uh, for an A uh, of 33. Yeah? How is there 63 uh, possible values? Uh, congratulations, you are awake. You, you found the... Um, better. Good catch. Okay, so... Um, 33, great. <coughs> So what if I wanted to do something similar, 
but now I wanted to find uh, values of A that were greater than 33. So the one easy bit here is I know that there are precisely uh, 22, 220 plus 630 plus uh, 100 plus 100, uh, 100, uh, math is right, that's uh, 1,250, uh, 270 distinct records uh, that are greater than 40. That gets me part of the way. Um, so there are 22 distinct records uh, for uh, 22 distinct records uh, for 40, 22 for 41, 22 for 42, 22 for 43. At least that's the assumption. Or the, the question was, why do I add a factor of 10? Okay, so 30 uh, values for uh, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, uh, 39, um, and I'll end up with, uh, what is that, 6 times 30 is 180 records, uh, in 180 of the 300 records uh, between 30 and 40, um, plus the 1,250 record, 270 records uh, between 40 and 80. Okay, uh, questions so far? Uh, could you uh, say again? How are there only four, you said 470 between 40 and 80? So between 40 and 80, there should be uh, 80, uh, um, uh, 1, 000, uh, there should be a thousand. 50 record, 1,050 records uh, between 40 and 80. Plus the 180 that you, uh, that are between 33 and, uh, above 33, but less than 40. Yeah? Basically what we're doing is we're taking smaller ranges and finding uniform distribution in that instead of the entire data sets whole. Bingo! You're, uh, you're basically computing, you're doing exactly the same thing that we were doing earlier, uh, you're just doing it at, at a more uh, fine-grained resolution. Uh, you're, you're picking off ranges, and for each range, you're computing uh, the, the count and the min and the max. Yeah? So you've got... Um, so for, let's copy this down. So you've got uh, 30... Uh, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to, so you've got the speckers, 31 to 40, uh, 41 to 50, 51 to uh, 60, and then, uh, so for every, every distinct value here, we have 30 records, for every distinct value here, we have 22. Uh, for every distinct value here, we have 63, um, and then 10 and 10. <coughs> so in total, this tells us that there are 220 records uh, in this bucket, total. So this is <clears throat> So there are 10 distinct values. Uh, so 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, and, and so forth. So, so the, the 
the, there are 220 total records in this bin, and we are making an assumption. Uh, so just uh, so we're essentially averaging out that entire bucket and just saying, okay, we could get more fine grained precision. Uh, maybe all 220 records are uh, are for value 41. But just as a simplifying assumption, we're going to say all of the records in that bucket have an equal number of, uh, of uh, uh, an equal number, sorry, all of the, the values that fall into that bucket have an equal number of records. So, so 30, 100, 100, uh, so this ends up being, just uh, between those, is 1,050. And then we get uh, in this range 180. Uh, so 180 plus uh, 1050 is uh, two, uh, 1,230. So 1,230 records total. Uh, uh, say again? Uh, so 31, 30, uh... Would it be 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40? Uh, you are correct. So this should be, um, 10. And that gives, so you're skipping 30, uh, 20, yeah, 210. I'm a computer scientist, so I <laughs> don't what calculators are for. Okay. Um, quite, uh, any other questions? All right, great. Um, so I briefly touched on this earlier um, and want to return to it because, uh, so actually, before I go on, any other questions about histograms in, in general? Uh, it's, like I said earlier, there's a huge rabbit hole that, that you can get into with, with histograms, uh, and I'd love to I'd love to spend more time on it, but uh, this this is not unfortunately a stats class, well, maybe fortunately, um, but uh, this is not a stats class. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, I'm happy to point you in the to, towards some some resources. But any other questions about how histograms could be used to to answer uh, these types of queries? All right. Uh, so one other heuristic. So another heuristic um, that we can use is information about the schema. Uh, so we've talked about key attributes and this idea that keys are unique. So if we know that uh, if we know that a particular attribute is a key, we know that any equality predicate is going to return exactly one row. Moreover, if we have uh, discrete value to type like an integer, uh, that, then we can also uh, find out the number of distinct values uh, that fall into a particular range. And similarly, foreign key joins uh, are always going to point to uh, foreign keys. Uh, you can always know that the, the size of a join on a foreign key relation is going to be uh, equal to the size of the relation uh, that, that contains the, the reference. Um, and in the last uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to introduce yet another uh, trick that you can, uh, you can pull uh, in order to get estimates. Excuse me. And that's sampling. So um, essentially what a histogram is, is giving us is it's, it's giving us some measure of uh, the data that appears in a, in a relation. And uh, that data is... Uh, conforms to some pretty arbitrary specifications. Like we're, uh, we are kind of bucketizing 41 to 50. We're essentially saying we don't care what specific value you, you, uh, you target in that range because we're going to treat all of them the same. Uh, the, uh, what we can do by sampling uh, is to get uh, something, uh, a similar set of statistics but statistics that are more specific to the type of workload that uh, we are uh, targeting um, 
uh, the, 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 the query that we're trying to answer at this particular moment. Uh, so what, um, the, what sampling-based optimizers will do is that they'll actually take a small chunk of the data, uh, maybe a couple of uh, hundred megabytes out of, uh, out of your petabyte data set, and just try them out, uh, see what happens, uh, compute the selectivity, uh, excuse me, compute the reduction factor uh, for just for that set of tuples. And then based on these, we can get, uh, we can get an estimate of uh, the, the overall reduction factors that we could expect to see. Um, now, the obvious question is, how many tuples do you need to actually uh, pick out in order to run, uh, run a realistic sample? And um, here you run into a couple of, of additional uh, problems, uh, or well, the, the, the kind of considerations that you need to take into account uh, when, when selecting the sample size is how selective your predicates are in the first place. Uh, so if I have, uh, if I filter out 99% of my tuples in, in the first uh, set and I only pick 10 tuples, I have a 1 in 10 chance of actually getting any tuples through uh, at all. Um, this uh, kind of relates, uh, a relative of this is uh, joins. So if I'm doing joins, um, I essentially want to find tuples that match up on both sides of the join. So if I pick, uh, if I pick a random tuple from R, I need to make sure that I pick a random tuple uh, from S that uh, is likely to match R, or else I'm going to pr uh, produce a very bad estimate. Um, and still another problem is if you're trying to estimate uh, the area of a, an aggregate output. So let's say I have 50 rows where A is 1 and one row where A is 2. I'm much, more, uh, much less likely to discover that there's a distinct value of, uh, of A that is, uh, to discover that there is a, a value of A that is 2. Um, more likely, my sample is going to contain lots and lots of 1s. Uh, let me illustrate a couple of uh, examples here. So let's say you have uh, 100 tuples in, uh, in a relation R. You're trying to join that with S and T. And you have a, select, uh, a selection predicate that filters out some chunk of those. Uh, so you, excuse me, you have a very large relation, but you pick 100 tuples as, as a sample. Um, if your selection predicate uh, filters out all of those tuples, you run into a problem. Because now the rest of your join plan is, you don't have any way of estimating the selectivity there. Uh, for joins, this is essentially a similar problem. Um, the, uh, what's, there's what's known as the birthday paradox. Uh, so the, the chance that uh, if I pick a random subset uh, of, of people, um, and then, sorry, if I pick one random person and I pick another random person, um, the, the chance that they're both going to share the same birthday is pretty minimal. Um, and in general, if I'm trying to, to pick from one set of, of records and a different set of records, and I'm trying to uh, pick a set of matching, uh, of, of, um, uh, matching birthdays or equality uh, 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 attributes that, that I'm doing an equijoin on, uh, then in general, I need to find, uh, I need to sample uh, the square root of, of um, the entire, uh, the, need to generate a sample that has uh, a number equal to the square root of the original uh, size of the, the relation uh, in order to reliably get a chance of uh, producing a pair uh, that actually joins together. The square root is, is pretty large. So that's not really a realistic thing to, to do. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not going to get too deeply into this. Instead, uh, I want to just bring up one other thing uh, that is uh, that occasionally comes up, and that's the idea that um, when you're doing optimization, often you're going to have 
a huge number of possible options. So if I'm doing a join between R, S, T, and U, how many possible uh, kind of parentheses could I get? More than one, uh, quite a bit more than one. And in fact, in general, um, if I have n uh, n different relations that I'm trying to join together, I get n, I can get uh, n minus one. Uh, in other words, a, a factor n minus one factorial um, different possible ways of joining those together. And doing cost based optimization for a wide join like this can get very very expensive. So one simplification that uh, occurs uh, quite frequently is this idea of only exploring left deep plans. Uh, so ages ago people realized that this uh, space was huge so what they they did was to only deal with uh, plans where you have um, uh, the the left side of the plan ends up uh, being uh, being an, a, a computed relation, and the right side of the plan ends, uh, always ends up being uh, just a, a uh, raw uh, relation that you get off of disk. This, uh, among other things, means that uh, makes it a lot easier to use index nested loop join, um, and it also ra uh, drastically reduces the search space uh, because you're only allowed to have uh, a polynomial number of uh, of uh, search plans. Okay, uh, just wanted to mention that um, just so you're aware of uh, what a left deep plan is. And uh, so the last thing I just want to bring up is uh, that heuristics, histogram sampling, everything that we've talked about today is meant to be good enough for the common case. Um, there are always going to be some cases where the uh, where these approaches don't give you the right answer, and in those cases, pretty much every database has some way of manually overriding the result. Um, so this is probably the worst hack ever. Uh, but Oracle has the ability to provide little uh, hints uh, as uh, comments in the query. Uh, so, for example, um, in this case. Uh, I'm telling the, the database that uh, I would like to use uh, an index nested, uh, sorry, an index scan uh, on employees uh, for this particular query. Um, Postgres has something uh, a little bit more uh, clever. Uh, so it has a statistics table, and that statistics table is just raw data. Um, you can you can modify muck with the statistics uh, table all you like. So if the the current statistics are not giving you the right results, you can mess uh, modify the statistics so that they more accurate accurately reflect the uh, properties that um, you'd like to see. Um, and one last thing, and I want to emphasize this a lot because if you're working with databases, this is an important tool to have. Uh, pretty much every single relational database has what's called an explain operator. And what explain does is you give it a query and it gives you back exactly the plan that it uses, uh, that it, it will use. So if you say explain, select uh, rank and, and age, it will give you back a representation of this along with uh, some estimates of basically what, what the optimizer is thinking. Uh, so in this particular case, it's telling me that it's going to do an aggregate, and it's estimating the aggregate's cost as being between 22.93 and 23.93. Uh, sorry, 23.93. Uh, um, and it's expecting to see one row in the output with uh, four columns in the output. And you can kind of use this to, to get inside the optimizer's head and figure out why it's, uh, why it's slow or why it's making certain choices. Um, I also encourage you to use, uh, so uh, SQLite is a, a great tool. I encourage you to, to try out uh, the explain operator with SQLite. Um, just as a way to, to see what uh, your queries could be doing uh, what your system could be doing uh, for the project. So, any final questions? 
All right, see everyone on Thursday.